everybody. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to come and talk to you this morning a little bit about some of the work that the Council of British Archaeology is doing in relation to young people. Um, young people is a is an interesting term depending on how you want to define it. Um, I'll start off by defining it quite young, um, under 16, um, and then I'll broaden out from that and talk about under 25, possibly even um, under 35. Um, to start with, though, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about CBA's Young Archaeologists Club, um, which is hopefully something that a lot of you are familiar with already, um, so I won't go into it in an enormous amount of detail, uh, but I hope there may also be people who have not come across it before. So I just want to explain a little bit about it, because it is quite a unique offering within archaeology in the UK, and indeed you know, in Europe and, and worldwide. Um, and its value across Europe um, was recognised uh, this year uh, when uh, we were successful in winning uh, a, a European prize for cultural heritage awarded by Europa Nostra. Um, and uh, that was a fantastic recognition um, of the work of the Archaeologist Club and all the people that are involved in it, because it's predominantly volunteers who are involved with it. Um, and it's been running now for 40 years, uh, which is a pretty amazing achievement, really, for something on this sort of scale. It started off very modestly. Uh, it started off with a small number of, of local groups, um, and then it expanded. The CBA um, took it on in the early 1990s, um, and since then it's really expanded very significantly, um, and it's very much a, a whole, whole UK-wide um, enterprise. Uh, there are two sort of aspects to the Archaeologist Club. The first is branches, which are all run by volunteers. And this is the map showing the current sort of distribution of, uh, of branches across the UK. Uh, as you can see, we reach pretty much all parts. Um, there are 70 odd branches across. Uh, each branch has a, effectively a volunteer leader team. Um, and of course, you have to be very conscious of all the responsibilities for working with young people across the UK, the different systems we have uh, for child protection. So we take that very seriously. Uh, there's a lot of training that's involved, which was provided to the volunteer leaders. Um, there's the um, disclosure and barring service, all the checking that goes on, which we undertake through the CBA office in York. Uh, and we try and support and work with uh, the ACT volunteers to ensure that they can give a quality experience to the participants of each branch. And the aim is that each branch runs 10 sessions a year, um, as open as possible, to attract the widest range of, of participants, normally between the ages of 8 and 16. Um, uh, sometimes that varies a little bit on either side of that, and we'll hear a little bit later on about some opportunities to expand into the post-16 uh, age group. But the majority of kids that come to the branches, in my experience certainly, um, are actually mostly in the, the 10 to 12 age range. That's the sort of real um, uh, key group of people. Sometimes you get some younger ones, sometimes you get some older ones as well. But the branches are a really fantastic opportunity for people and some people go through the whole range from literally they join the branches when they're young, they're about eight to nine, they come through, they have a seven or eight year um, long-term experience and, and the opportunity to do all sorts of different aspects of archaeology. Interestingly, if you look at the demographic of the leaders, the volunteers um, of these branches, I think actually it's almost unique in archaeology and it, it does attract many of the people that we're talking about here today, um, the 16 to 24, possibly the 16 to 35 year old range. Uh, more than any other part of archaeology, I think that you find them as the leaders, the volunteer leaders of Yak branches. Um, and I think there's some interesting issues as to why that is. Is that because they're particularly focused on young people, working with young people, they've had that experience themselves, they want to give something back, they want to be active, a um, number of other possible motivations. But I think it's that, that is a really interesting target audience in terms of the, the demographic that we're talking about today. The sort of activities that, uh, that the branches undertake are extremely varied. Um, some of them do um, mostly classroom sort of based activities. Um, a lot of them get out in the field, they have trips, they, have, they actually do field work. Um, there are some examples across the country of where um, new sites have been added to the historic environment record through original research undertaken by the YAC branches, which is great. Um, experimental archaeology is something that's always popular. Um, dressing up and, uh, and uh, those sorts of activities, reconstruction activities, always popular. But the great thing is, again, it can be very varied. Um, and across, if you're having 10 sessions a year, you can do a whole variety of different things um, and, and approach different topics, different um, chronological periods, uh, different themes in archaeology, uh, and keep it interesting and lively. This is supposed to be making archaeology fun for young people. It's not 
school. This is uh, out of school activity, informal education, uh, and the ethos of YAC is very much you know, learning through fun, um, engaged with archaeology. Previously, um, the other element of YAC, other than the branches, was a, a nationwide membership club. Um, and people used to join, pay a modest fee, up to about £15 in the last few years. Um, and for that, they would get a magazine, they would get a certificate, they would get access to competitions, various other things. And that was predominantly uh, for people who were unable to join a branch because there wasn't one near them um, or it wasn't suitable for them for whatever reason. We wanted to provide an alternative option. But increasingly, the feedback we were getting in recent years was that the, the magazine arriving um, four times a year wasn't sufficient uh, continual engagement for young people in that age range. They wanted more engagement, they wanted more frequent contact, they wanted digital access. So in the last year, we've decided that we're going to move away from that more exclusive sort of membership club model um, and actually um, provide access to everybody through a, a dynamic website. Um, so the new YAC website, which was launched earlier this year at Stonehenge with Julian Richards there, um, is an open resource um, which is available to anybody. Um, the idea is it's frequently updated. We have a, a member of staff who works three days a week, um, Nikki Milstead, on updating the website, keeping it lively, running competitions, a lot of the things that we've always done, um, but now um, offered through a website uh, for everybody. Um, and of course, part of the hope of that is because it, um, archaeology for all, which is what CBA espouses, and this can very much be more accessible to people. Uh, and hopefully it's also a mechanism for attracting more financial support, uh, which is important to sustain the club and keep it going. Um, one of the interesting things about YAC's alumni, people who have been members of YAC uh, over the years, is how many of them have gone on and become archaeologists. Of course, you know, it's, not, it's not obligatory. If you're a member of YAC, you don't have to become an archaeologist. Um, but interestingly, many of them do. So how many of you here have been a member of the Young Archaeologist Club at some point? Okay, a few, yeah, so that's always good. Um, and uh, this is uh, just as an example, really, James Denny, who was uh, a YAC member, um, has now gone on, got a degree in archaeology, is now doing his PhD in archaeology. Um, and there are many examples around, many professional archaeologists, until recently the chief executive of English Heritage, Simon Thurley, he was an ex yak member, um, and there are other good examples around. So it, it is a really good way of developing skills and experience and effectively changing people's lives, giving them a, you know, a whole career, a whole sort of lifestyle for the future. <coughs> but one of the great things about YAK is it also shows young people what archaeology is about. Um, and one of the barriers to participation for young people is a lack of understanding about what archaeology is actually about and what it offers. Um, there's a, a, a perception, often derived from watching TV programmes like Time Team, that archaeology is a, is a certain sort of discipline. It's a field discipline. You go out, you, you get dirty, um, you do those sorts of activities that we're all familiar with in terms of field archaeology. That isn't for everybody. It doesn't necessarily appeal to everybody. Um, and one of the most interesting things when you're looking at the, the, um, the range of people who apply to study archaeology at university at the moment, the numbers of people studying, applying to study archaeology are falling. The number of people studying, applying to study anthropology are going up. And some research has been done recently as to why is that. Um, and one of the key messages that comes back is that students don't perceive that archaeology is about um, big issues, about answering big questions about challenging notions and, and perceptions of, of life and culture. That's what anthropology does. Archaeology, the perception is, it's a field discipline, uh, it's a very vocational discipline, um, it's about technical skills, it's not about those big issues. Um, and I think that is, a lot of that comes from um, programmes like Time Team, which is not the fault of Time Team, that wasn't what they were necessarily trying to do, but that's the perception that's been created by some of these things, which is actually off-putting. Um, to a significant proportion of young people, because that's not actually what they're interested in. Um, anybody that wants to follow up on, on more information about YAC, that's the website, um, contact details there. Do feel free to get in touch. We're always looking for volunteers who want to come forward to run more branches. There's huge demand for branches of YAC across the country. Um, if you think that you've got the capacity and interest and you have a group around you that might be able to support that, do get in touch with us uh, and we can explain a bit more about the support we can give you if, if you want to do that because it is a really rewarding thing to be doing for, for the leader team as well as for um, the young people, the participants themselves. 
because of CBA's broader um, experience and our engagement of the young people, particularly through YAC, but also through um, the, the older age range, one of the things we've been very conscious of, and we've had a lot of um, uh, people saying to us over the years, is that it's a real shame that people get this fantastic opportunity through YAC, which can be sustained for many years, but then they get to the age of 16 and they have to stop. They, don't, they can't participate in YAC anymore. Um, now, that's actually not necessarily true, uh, because they can become a leader at that point. Uh, they're having, if they've had a fantastic experience as a, as a YAC branch member, why not say, well, actually, I'd like to be an assistant leader of the branch um, and give something back. Um, so there are ways in which people can still get involved with YAC. Um, but the perception is that, that, that there isn't the support, there isn't the opportunity for people post-16 to continue that involvement with archaeology. So a few years ago, about five years ago now, um, we had the opportunity to get some funding from the Heritage Lottery Fund um, through their Skills for the Future programme. Um, and what we did was we offered a whole series of year-long workplace learning bursaries to predominantly young people to give them an opportunity to work with archaeological host organisations across the UK. And the aim of that was it was a training experience for those, for those people, those, those bursary holders. But it was also an opportunity for the host organisations to really think hard and step up what they were doing in terms of their work with young people, as well as broader community archaeology work. Um, and the, the aim was that the, um, each uh, bursary holder had a, a year's experience paid for um, through HLF funding, which was much uh, appreciated. The host organisations often benefited and, uh, and often many of them at the end of the year experience actually took that person on onto their staff because they'd recognised that the work that they were doing was an important part of the offer for that organisation. Many archaeological organisations, even the bigger archaeological contractors, are charities. They have a responsibility to deliver a public benefit. Um, that I'm not convinced they always necessarily do that to the degree that they have the capability to do. Um, and I think one of the hopes was that this programme would help to embed that better right across the discipline. Um, not just within those individual organisations, but as a network of community archaeology facilitators. Um, and about half of our Skills for the Future um, bursaries were specifically targeted at trying to work with young people and get those archaeological organisations who ranged from national organisations down to smaller local organisations, museums, archaeological contractors, get them all thinking about how to continue to embed that work with young people in everything that they do. Um, the programme of work, um, the, the Workplace Learning Bursary Programme, which ran from 2011 to 2015, uh, there was an evaluation done at the end. If anybody wants to read up a little bit more, there's a research bulletin that CBA published. You can download it from the uh, web address up on the top right-hand corner there. That will give you a little bit of the context of the programme, some of the things we were trying to achieve, some of the barriers that we came up against, and some of the issues that were, that were really uh, pertinent in terms of trying to embed this across the archaeological discipline. Uh, and of course, one of the real issues for us, I think, in archaeology is inevitably and always a frustrating lack of resources. Um, we, there, we're never short of enthusiasm, we're never short of commitment, um, and that's absolutely commendable. But we rarely have the resources to really go out to large groups uh, and scale up the sort of activities that we run. So sometimes they can appear quite modest, I think, when you do evaluations and when you talk to people, the number of people you've reached out to. Um, and I, for, a, for a few years, I sat on a, a, a regional committee of the Heritage Lottery Fund, actually looking at applications and judging bids. And what was quite instructive was that the way that they, the, the system worked was, uh, to my mind, it worked against bids coming from organisations who wanted to work with people. Because the question that always came up was about the value for money in terms of the, the number of people that you were going to go out and reach. Um, and when you hear about projects that are reaching thousands of people, um, and our projects come in and they're talking about more modest numbers, partly because we don't have the capacity within our organisations to reach out to a larger number. That's a bit of a difficulty. Um, and I think we need to think a little bit more about how we can work together in a more collaborative environment to actually scale up some of the, the, the opportunities that we can provide. Um, coming out of this work um, through our Workplace Learning Bursary Programme, we wanted to think a little bit more about, well, actually, what what are the needs of young people um, more broadly, not just for the under 16s, but particularly thinking about this group from 16 to 24, and perhaps a little bit, um, little bit beyond that. Um, so we've also done some research, particularly looking at those issues. And again, there's a, a research bulletin that was published 
uh, a year or two ago, uh, which can also be downloaded from the, um, the address up there. Um, one of the things that came out from that was very much this issue about the perception of archaeology um, in relation to other disciplines. Um, young people are really keen to engage with archaeology, but they don't really know what it is. And one of the challenges we have is to actually get out there and explain to people what archaeology actually is and what it can contribute to people's lives. Explain to them that it's not a vocational um, course if you study it at university. It's very much a general course. It's got a huge range of transferable skills. It can lead people in all sorts of life directions. It's not a, not a cul-de-sac uh, in, in that sense in, in any way at all. Um, a lot of interest out amongst young people in volunteering and being active. And I think this has been, over the years, has been rather captured by the environmental conservation sector. And if you look at groups like what used to be called the British Trust for Conservation Volunteers, BTCV, they used to have huge um, armies of young people who would go out and do woodland clearance, uh, environmental work, uh, mopping up sites, um, protecting sites. We haven't quite got that same sort of degree of engagement and opportunity in archaeology. Um, and again, people want to, particularly young people, I think nowadays, want to be seen to be putting something back. You know, if you have to fill in your, your UCAS application form to go to university, it's not just about your academic qualifications. It's about what you've, did, what you've um, put back to society as an individual, what you've been involved with, what skills you've developed. Um, and I think we're missing out on opportunities to actually engage with young people by not providing those opportunities. Um, and I think there's more we can do, both right across the discipline. And it's an area that the CBA is very keen to think a little bit more about and uh, see what we can do working with our members, uh, who are organisations as well as um, individuals. One of the ways that young people can perhaps first connect um, with um, archaeology is by studying A-level archaeology. Unfortunately, there is no GCSE in archaeology at the moment, which I think is a real disaster for our discipline. Um, and we really need to try and make, put some pressure on the exam boards to bring that qualification back. Um, even the A-level is only offered by one exam board, AQA, um, and it has a, a reputation that it's quite a difficult A-level to do. And a lot of tutors are put off from teaching it um, because it's quite a complicated A-level to teach and deliver without a great deal of support and resources. Hopefully that's about to change because the exam board is now undertaking a review of A-level archaeology and there'll be a new syllabus coming out in 2017. We also did some work, and again, another research board is again downloadable for free for anybody that wants to access these things, um, looking at the current A-level and some of the perceptions of the students and the tutors. One of the biggest frustrations at the moment for, for us, certainly in CBA office, is we frequently get contact from potential students saying, I'd like to study A-level archaeology, where can I go and study it? And absurdly, we can't answer that question because there's no publicly accessible resource that says where you can go and study A-level archaeology. Uh, the exam board are unable to publish a list of the teach the centres where, where you can study A-level archaeology due to the restrictions of the Data Protection Act, which to me is absolute nonsense. Um, so we've been talking to them, we've been trying, we've tried a number of routes to get hold of this information. I, I tried going through um, an MP and seeing if we could get it through the education department. It's just not, uh, not accessible in that way. So recently we've had further dialogue with AQA as the exam board and what they've agreed um, is that they will send a letter from us at the CBA to all the tutors um, and the letter which we've just sent says, this is absurd, you know, you're losing out on potential students. Um, by the fact we can't publicise where you are. If you tell us where you are um, and who you are, we can then publicise that. So what I'm hoping to do is build up that list from the ground up, effectively. Get the tutors to contact us, give us their... They don't need to give us their personal uh, contact details. They can just give us the web page um, on their college or university or, or uh, whatever website that relates to their particular course that they offer. And then hopefully we can bring all those together and provide a way that actually more people can engage with A-level archaeology. Because I think it is really important that more people get that opportunity. And that will hopefully also lead to more people going and thinking about studying archaeology at university and potentially developing a career in archaeology. At the moment, we're faced with a situation that actually, particularly because of one or two large infrastructure projects coming down the track, like HS2, the high-speed railway, we will not have enough archaeologists in the country in the next few years to do all the work that we know is coming. We need to train up more archaeologists. 
Um, now, there's, a, you know, there's an issue with that, because what we don't want is a sort of boom and bust scenario where we train up archaeologists for the next five years, only to find that six years after that, we're in recession again, there's no development, there's no jobs, everybody goes. Um, we want to try and provide sustainable opportunities for employment. But of course, it doesn't always have to be people who are engaged through uh, employment in archaeology. One of the great things about archaeology is it's something you can do as a volunteer, as a pastime, you can fit it in around other activities, and that often appeals particularly to the younger age range. Um, and I think we need to get that message across too, that through things like the growth of community archaeology in recent years, um, there are more opportunities for young people to make an active contribution. We're doing some work at the moment, um, uh, which I'm not, uh, unfortunately, it's not quite finished. So I, I hoped it would be, so I could talk about it in a little bit more detail about the people that go to the CBA's Festival of Archaeology. Um, we, those of you that know about this event, it started off as National Archaeology Day quite a long time ago. It's grown over the years. It now goes over um, two weeks, um, 16 days, um, and it's about 1,500 events all around the UK um, over this two-week period in July. We've been doing some research on the people that go to the festival events, and we've been particularly interested in young people um, and whether they whether they go, why they go, why they don't go. Uh, and the one, I, unfortunately, we haven't got the detail yet, but one of the most interesting things that's coming out so far from that, um, and I don't quite understand why, I'd be interested to know if anybody's got thoughts on it really, um, it appears that far more young people are going to festival events in rural areas than urban areas. Um, and that also, interestingly, mirrors uh, something that we've noticed through university applications to study archaeology. More people, more, <clears throat> more potential students from rural areas are applying to study archaeology than urban areas. Why is that? Interesting. I don't know. You can tell me. Um, there is still a, a, an issue about how people get involved uh, if they want to continue their interest as young people. There's still a perception, particularly amongst the local archaeological societies, as, as Laura was saying earlier, uh, that the, they, they go along to meetings, they're the youngest person in the room by 40 years, uh, they don't see a role model, <clears throat> it's not for them, um, they don't go back. Um, societies are very, very aware of that, they're really thinking quite strongly about what happens from then on. So it's an issue that the um, societies are very um, keen to address, they, they welcome thoughts too. That's the end of the presentation. I'll be very happy to ask questions, discuss, have discussion later on. I think this is a really important topic. You know, the, the, the young people that we're engaging with today are not just the archaeologists of the future, they're also the politicians of the future, the chancellors, the exchequers of the future. If we want to think about resources for archaeology, we want to think about advocacy for archaeology, young people are clearly an important target audience for that too. Um, and I'll be interested to hear the best of the talks today to see how we can do a bit better together. And, uh, and if anybody has any thoughts uh, from your particular context, your particular backgrounds, on how the CBA could be helping, um, and helping you individually or addressing some of these issues, I'm always very keen to hear those thoughts. Thanks very much.